Welcome to the Charles George VA Medical Center. I am Steve Henderson, Vice President of the Buncombe County Veterans Council and President of the North Carolina Veterans Writing Alliance Foundation, known as the Brothers and Sisters Like These. I'll be your Master of Ceremony. This Veterans Day is sponsored by the Charles George VA Medical Center, Buncombe County Veterans Council, and the City of Asheville Mayor's Committee for Veterans Affairs. We especially want to thank the Mayor Mannheimer for the City of Asheville contributing during the last three years, COVID years, making sure our ceremonies took place. I would first like to welcome and introduce Robin Ramsey from Senator Tilly's office. She has a short note from our Senator. Thank you, I greatly appreciate the invitation to be here today. Dear friends, I am pleased to extend my greetings to everyone at the Veterans Day Ceremony at Charles George VA Medical Center. Today we honor the millions of Americans who have served our great nation and express our appreciation for their dedication to the ideals upon which it is founded. As we reflect on the valor of these brave men and women, we must remember that it is through their sacrifice that America continues to stand as a beacon of freedom throughout the world. Thank you for your incredible devotion and love for our country. May God bless each of you and your families, and may he continue to bless the United States of America. Sincerely, Tom Tillis, U.S. Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Next, I would like to introduce the mayor of Asheville. The mayor has uh, a committee that I serve on, the Veterans Committee for the mayor of Asheville. This has been a real good experience for me and the veterans that have served. We appreciate all the support that she has given us over the last few years and making our ceremonies possible and dishonoring veterans and their families. Mayor Mannheimer. Thank you. On behalf of the city of Asheville and Asheville City Council, I'd like to welcome you to this Veterans Day ceremony. I'd also like to thank members of the Buncombe County Veterans Council and Mayor's Committee for Veteran Affairs for planning today's event and inviting me to speak. I'd also like to give a special thank you to those volunteering their time for service, for this service today. Steve Henderson, Larry Fowler, Ted Minnick, Rick Ledford, and the Owen High School JROTC. I would also like to recognize Stephanie Young and Jeff Miller for their incredible work and service, as well as Ann Adkins, Dean Little, and Monica Blankenship from brothers and sisters like these for their service and readings today. Now, I would like to personally thank our United States military veterans and those on active duty, as well as their families and loved ones who are here with us today. We are here to honor the men and women who have given their lives to secure the safety and freedoms we hold so dear, freedoms which we often take for granted. On this Veterans Day, let us remember the words of President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy forget in time that men have died to win them. Leading up to this election, I was listening to the news and they were interviewing folks going to the polls to vote. The reporter was interviewing a gentleman who identified himself as a veteran and he explained that because of his service, he understood deeply the need to vote and exercise the rights and freedoms we have worked so hard to attain in this country. I appreciated the importance of his message. What we owe to these brave men and women is more than we could ever repay. But let's start by saying thank you. 
And we, as a community, should never be hesitant to say thank you on this day or any day. I also want to restate the city's commitment to supporting the veterans in our community and raising awareness of community resources available. So thank you once again to the men and women who have made the supreme sacrifice protecting our nation and privileges of freedom. You are all heroes among us. Thank you for your service. Our ceremony is taking place in the atrium of the Charles George VA Medical Center, which commemorates the heroism of the sacrifice of Private First Class Charles George, Congressional Medal of Honor recipient, and our med medical center's namesake, and honors the service of veterans, past and present, next to us in the Outside is the memorial dedicated to the Western North Carolina veterans who gave their life in service to country in Vietnam War, presented by the VVA. Today's ceremony is about honoring the service of every veteran who has served their nation in war or peacetime. Thank you for your sacrifices to keep us fr our freedom. Please remember, freedom isn't free. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, when the guns fell silent, we will always remember. This time I'm going to introduce three people. One will be given the invocation, one will present colors, and the other one will give the national, or the uh, ROTC will give the uh, but the first one is the invocation, and it's given by Larry Fowler, a, a retired Air Force Chief Master Sergeant, Vietnam veteran, Secretary Chaplain for the Buncombe County Veterans Council. Larry, would you come up, please? Let us pray. Gracious Father, we acknowledge that you have been our tower of strength and protection in all of our generations. Now we call upon you again for you, let your favor be upon our men and women in uniform who have volunteered to stand against evil intent on our destruction. Show your favor to those veterans who now suffer physical and mental wounds in the defense of freedom. Show your favor on our vets as they age, may, may they be an example of integrity and patriotism. Let them be the peacemakers. Gracious Father, we ask you to bless and keep us, to make your face to shine upon us and be gracious to us and give us your face in peace. Go in your grace and bless our nation. This we ask in your precious name, amen. This time we'll have the presentation of colors by the Charles D. Owen High School Junior ROTC, led by Jeffrey Garland, Sergeant First Class, U.S. Army, retired. Please join me in saying a pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming? 
whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave Carry. Our first presenter will be Stephanie Young, director of the Charles George VA. Thank you, Director Young, for taking care of those who have served our country. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this Veterans Day 2022. Veterans, this ceremony is but a small token when compared to your service, sacrifices, and willingness to protect our country. Our hope is that you'll be able to glean a fraction of that admiration and appreciation we have for you on this day and every day. Freedom can so easily be taken for granted. Some people forget just how hard it is to achieve it and that you are the ones who have done that work to accomplish that for all of us. This is not the case for our team here at Charles George in Western North Carolina VA healthcare system. Our culture is one of understanding and support. Here, we understand that without you, we would not be able to enjoy the privileges we have in this country. And we know that supporting you is the sole reason the VA exists. Again, I offer our thanks. Not everyone has the tenacity and patriotism it takes to bravely lead a life knowing that they could be called upon any day to lay down their own life for their fellow countrymen. That's why every year, on November 11th, the country takes pause. It is an opportunity to honor our nation's veterans, including the members of our Western North Carolina community who have answered the call to service in our country's military. It's a day we set aside when we're called upon to consider the meaning of veteran services and to reflect on the liberties we enjoy because of their sacrifices. It's a day for all Americans, and it's intended to honor and appreciate all the men and women who served in the United States military. On this day, parades, church services, and ceremonies like this have been organized. It is a day of celebration and a day of honor. It was originally called Armistice Day and it marked the end of the fighting during the Great War, the war to end all wars. It was very significant to those who lived and saw the devastation it caused. Those who fought and returned found their lives changed forever. They came home to a world changed by war. However, Americans would go to war many times after that. Heroes answered the call to serve their country and to fight for our country's freedom. And they continue to answer that call today. The service members we're all here to honor come from every walk of life, yet they share 
the same fundamental qualities. They possess courage, pride, determination, selflessness, dedication to duty, and integrity. All the qualities needed to serve a card charge larger than oneself. Our staff is inspired by this courage and selflessness of our nation's heroes. And our desire is that it shows every day in the way we interact with our veterans. It starts when you drive onto our campus, you walk through our front doors, or we make that first phone call to you. We hope that you can call Western North Carolina VA Healthcare System your home. Integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. That's our eye care values. We share that with every VA in the nation. And we uphold that every day in honor of our veterans. Maintaining our culture and respect for service to those who have served, it's ingrained in us. When we first came to work at the VA, we took an oath. It's an oath, a pledge that we take seriously. We say it with full conviction and we maintain our purpose and dedication to our veterans every day. If there are things we need to improve, we never become complacent. That is because improving our work is our work. If there are things we need to improve, we'll be doing that every day. So from all of us to all of you, I offer our deepest appreciation, respect, and admiration for the peace and liberty that we enjoy in this country. From Western North Carolina VA Healthcare System, we thank every veteran for their service. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored today to have as our keynote speaker, Jeff Miller. Jeff, son of a World War II veteran, is the co-founder of, of Honor Air, which became the Honor Flight Network that takes veterans to the military memorials in Washington, D.C., honoring their service to our country. He is also the founder and president of Blue Ridge Honor Flight. By the end of 2017, over 200,000 veterans throughout the country have flown on the honor flight. Veterans from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Also, Jeff is honored, <clears throat> was honored in 2013 by the, the Governor Pat McCrory of North Carolina for being awarded the Order of the Longleaf Pine Award. The highest honor the Governor of North Carolina can bestow on one of its citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce a true patriot who has dedicated his life in honor of those who have served our country in peacetime and in war. Thanks, Steve. And uh, thank you, Director Young, for uh, hosting this event and for your passion for veterans and your dedication to them. Uh, this whole area is blessed to have you here, so thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation to be here, Steve, and no better place to be on, uh, on Veterans Day than right here. I'm sorry we couldn't be outside and surrounded by so many veterans that wanted to come, but we take what we've got and we roll with it. Uh, I love being anywhere that brothers and sisters like these are doing readings. Uh, I'm just glad I'm going first so I don't have to hear them and get upset. I always get emotional with them because their words are so strong, so comforting, and so healing to so many. And that organization, we're so proud to, to be a partner with them and always look forward to being there. I want to give a shout out to one of their founding members, Mr. David Robinson, who is a uh, he couldn't be with us today. He's going through some, some medical issues, but 
we cannot wait to have him back and reading again because his reading is what everything's uh, measured up against. And he is also, I just found out today, he, his reading is where the name came from. So Steve shared that with me. Uh, and now for just a, a brief disclaimer, I'm not a veteran and that's a huge void in my life. It's, uh, it, it's something I wish I could change, but uh, rather than that, I've committed my life as much of it as possible to honoring those of you that have served this country. And for that, I'm grateful. And I've known for a long time that everything good in my life is because of the service and sacrifice of folks like you. And thank you for that. Uh, I know our focus today is on Veterans Day, but I dare to say that uh, we really should realize that every day should be Veterans Day. And we should never lose that focus. Now I am the founder of an organization called Honor Air back in 2006 with a group of my friends that were nothing short of amazing. And that organization is now Blue Ridge Honor Flight. Now Honor Air, our original mission was to fly all of Henderson County's World War II veterans to DC to see the memorial built for them. It was open 59 and a half years after the war was over. Uh, we had no idea how many veterans would sign up for it, really didn't know. And um, one flight, well, it turned into two flights, and two flights, it turned into three flights. And by the time we had uh, we had finished the Henderson County, it was six flights, and I'm speaking of chartered jets out of the Asheville Airport, um, 100 veterans on each flight. So we can definitely say that the idea got wings, it did well and it really took off. But before Honor Air took a break, after we had done our, uh, our six flights, or right after we had done our six, Rotarians in the Asheville area jumped in and took over and they did 13 flights from this area. So they were amazing in taking what we created and stepping it up and polishing that jewel. Um, after we took a, a break, after we had flown all the World War II veterans, we started seeing a real need to work with homeless veterans in this area. So after that, we began to focus our work purely on the, on the homeless veterans. And we did great things and lots of good things with the VRQ here, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. But in 2016, we fired things up again and we wanted to, to start back. And we launched with uh, taking care of more World War II veterans that had shown up and also uh, the Korean War veterans. Now let's step back to 2007. And the leadership of Honor Air and the leadership of a group in Ohio called Honor Flight, a gentleman named Earl Morris had created that group. And he was really the inspiration for all of us. He was uh, working in a VA as a, as a physician's assistant, and he saw the need for some type of transportation for the World War II veterans who were getting pretty aged at that time to get to see their memorial. And he was a pilot, is a pilot, and he would fly uh, two veterans at a time in a small plane. And that's how I first heard about this, uh, this honor flight group and really realized the need to provide transportation to veterans. We just wanted to do it a little bit different. But in 2007, we uh, met in DC with the leadership of Honor Flight and with Honor Air, and we created what's now known the Honor Flight Network. Now this network has spread throughout the country, and it's now in 43 states, 133 hubs, and in May, we landed our 250,000th veteran into DC and that was a big celebration for us and what it did to me is it shows me that if you give people an opportunity to do something good for veterans that they'll step up and do it we hear a lot of bad stuff in this country right now but I want to tell you there's a lot of good quiet people in the shadows that are looking for a reason to support the folks that have given us all the life that everyone is in envy of uh, Kind of amusing this last we've got a group even in alaska that's been flying but this last weekend we had our first hub flight out of hawaii now that took a while it took quite a while to get everybody over here for that 
But now we go back to 2006. Like I said, we were flying mainly World War II veterans. That was our focus. But something happened that day that made me know that Honor Air, Honor Flight Now, was not going to be just for World War II veterans. On this day, we decided we had time to go visit the Korean War Veterans Memorial, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. We did two flights as we started up that weekend in 2006. September 23rd, we visited the World War II Memorial, and then we shot over to Arlington National Cemetery to lay a wreath there and watch the changing of the guard. Little tour of DC back to the airport and home. We were getting our legs under us. The next day, we realized we had a little extra time, so that day, after we spent a couple of hours at the World War II Memorial, we went over to the Lincoln, Korea, and Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And I hadn't really thought about it, but I had a couple of friends with us that day that were Vietnam veterans, and they were guardians, which a guardian is the person that is responsible for these veterans uh, for the day. They make sure they have water, uh, any medicines they're supposed to take. Uh, just in general, be a guardian for them, take care of anything they need. Well, a couple of the guardians there were um, Vietnam veterans, and they had two World War II veterans. So I was walking down after we'd gotten over to uh, the Korean Memorial and the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. It took a little while to unload three buses, get everything squared away, a lot of wheelchairs. I walked down to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, the wall. And that place is sacred. It's the most sacred place inside DC. Arlington, that's in Virginia. And it's sacred, it's quiet, you don't hear a lot of people talking loud, it's more in whispers. And the names, they demand respect. And I'm proud to say that they get it. But I looked and I saw the Vietnam veteran that was the guardian for the two World War II veterans. And the Vietnam veteran was touching the wall. He was touching the names of friends he had lost. And I looked in the World War II veteran, one of them was under his right arm, and one of them was under his left arm, and they were holding him up. And it took me to my knees. <clears throat> I knew at that moment we would be where we are today, and that's focusing on Vietnam veterans. And I can't tell you how happy I am to be able to do that. Uh, now, understand we still take World War II veterans and Korean War veterans. They have priority. They get the front for obvious reasons. But 90% of the veterans we fly, and most of the veterans that are flying across the country now are Vietnam veterans. So I'm speaking to you. We really want to, you to trust us and let us give you a personal day of honor. I know you're not looking for it, but still, that's what we'd like to do. You'll be there with your comrades. You'll be there with your brothers and sisters. No one will attempt to make you do anything you don't want to do. We know better than that. And you'll see the memorial with your friends or you don't have to go in and see it. But either way, you'll have a good day. Just to give you an idea of what we do, we visit the Vietnam and Korean memorials first. Lincoln Memorial is there too. Then we, uh, we visit World War II Memorial, the Navy Memorial, the Air Force Memorial, the Marine Corps Memorial, and Arlington National Cemetery. It's a big day, but we're pretty darn good at what we do. And uh, we don't necessarily get out at everyone, but we try to give everybody a good visual of it. Uh, and something else is just amazing to me that I'm equally proud of that really we have no control over. I want you to know with each flight's return, there's been anywhere from hundreds of folks waiting to thousands of folks waiting at the Asheville airport to give you a welcome home, a welcome home that was very different than what you had in the past. And we know we can't make bad memories go away, but we sure as heck want to stack good memories on top of it. And these folks all come out because they want to, not because they have to. No one's paid, no one's on staff. They just show up. And our partners at Asheville Airport, Asheville Regional Airport, incredible, and we thank them for it. And we've added another little uh, thing to our flights. And 
That's all because of a wonderful lady that has come on board that will be reading for you in just a minute, Miss Ann Atkins, who is a gold star mom. And Ann has pointed out to us the healing power of being on honor flights with all these veterans that a gold star family member can get. So if any gold star family members are listening, we're coming for you. We want you to come and spend a day with us and build a relationship. We have a lot of veterans that want to put their arms around you and hold you and, and let you see how much you're honored. You're, you're like so many things that we see you're sacred to us. So it'll be on our website, blueridgehonorflight.com soon. So watch for that. Now, there's more to what Blue Ridge Honor Flight does. I'm very proud of that. For the past 12 years, we've worked with ABCCM, Mr. Reverend Scott Rogers, to see that every resident of the VRQ, the homeless residents, best, uh, Veterans Restoration Quarters, receives Christmas gifts, uh, warm coats, gloves, hats, backpacks, because these folks all walk, um, ride a moped or a bike or a bus to the VA, to their jobs, to um, whatever they're working towards. So it's important that we help them do that. We've also worked with a new project, ABCCM, that's incredible, Transformation Village. Uh, we provided all the linens, towels, sheets, everything uh, for that facility, and it's an incredibly good thing. And I want you to know, the, these facilities are amazing. Within one year of arriving homeless at the shelters, eight out of 10 of the guests find a good job and settle with permanent housing. 97% are still healthy, housed, and working after two years. And I just don't think you can find anything that touches that. It's amazing. We've also established a fund for Vietnam veterans being treated for Agent Orange-related issues, and we know how much that is now. Um, things we help with are, if they're in the far west of this area, gas cards to help them there. We, you know, tires on cars, lift chairs to help them in and out of things at home, installing internet service. So it, it's not huge things, but this, this was established by a widow of a Vietnam veteran who, who died from the complications of exposure to Agent Orange. So we reach out beyond flights to DC. Uh, we're, we're built of a group of people that have a passion of veterans and non-veterans that, that work with folks. So lots is going on. Um, would like to point out that our next flight is April 29th. And we already have about 50 um, veterans signed up for it. So please, if you're interested in going with us, talk to some veterans that have gone. Like I said, we're good at it. It's, it's a day of honor that you've earned and deserved and we're proud to give. Um, go to blueridgehonorflight.com, download the veterans application and send it in. Uh, if you wanna be a guardian, do the same, download a guardian's application. That being said, I uh, wanna thank our host again and all the folks that have put this together. It's always an honor to be around heroes. So God bless each and every one of you. Stay safe in the day, stay dry. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Miller. And thank you for all the Blue Ridge Honor Flight does for veterans. I would like you to remember that every veteran, every Gold Star parent, every widow that's in our group has a story to tell. And so you're going to hear some beautiful stories today. Our first story will be from the brothers and sisters like these. And the first person that will speak her son gave the ultimate sacrifice in Iraq. In turn, Anne, her husband, and daughter gave the ultimate sacrifice. So at this time, 
I would like to introduce you to Ann Atkins. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. On July 16th, 1982, a miracle happened to me. I wanted a child so badly, and when I looked at my newborn son's Matthew's face, I was totally consumed with such love that I had never experienced before. It filled my heart, my mind, and my soul. Thank you, God. I was blessed. Tears of pure joy filled my eyes. And then tears also filled my eyes when my husband and Matthew's father walked out the door, leaving us when Matthew was three months old. Can't lie, it was difficult working full time with a newborn, but that act, you know what, that created a bond between us that was never, ever broken. It was tough, but we made it work. I was in media, and to make an extra money that we needed so badly, I would go on nighttime commercial shoots, leaving Matthew with friends, as I didn't have money for a nighttime babysitter. But every time I would leave, he would burst into tears, hold up his little arms, and cry, me, mommy, me. He wanted to be with me, and he was. I made him a bed in the car, and he would sleep there, and it was fine. We were together, and that's what we wanted. That was pretty much all that mattered. Then a second miracle occurred about five years later when we met the wonderful man with whom we shared our lives. He became Matthew's true father and my loving husband. And Matthew had always talked about having a little sister, and now he realized, the boy, that, that might happen. Barely pregnant, I said Target was having a baby sale. And Matthew said, oh, please, Mama, please, let's go buy a baby. They're on sale. I want a sister so bad. Please, Mommy, please, please, a little sister. Well, his wish came true. <laughs> With Emma's birth and a so special bond between the two was formed. They became inseparable. And that bond never yielded and continues today. But upon Matthew's death in Iraq on May the 3rd, 2007, Emma went into a very serious and life-threatening decline. But we'll read about that later. We were a family. We were a really happy family. And a memory that I will never forget was when I got an advancement job offer, which meant a move to Portland, Oregon. Well, we sat down with the kids. And we said, I could move there ahead of them, and that way they could finish their school year in Louisville. But Matthew looked at me and said, why would we do that, Mama? We need to be together. We're a family, and we need to move as a family. We don't ever want to be apart, do we? Well, we moved together. We should have known that the military was the path Matthew would choose for his life. It seemed strange for us at the time, but now it just kind of seems like destiny. The first toys he wanted were toy soldiers and then tanks, then more of both. When he was older, his favorite channel was the History Channel, and he knew so much about military history. I mean, he studied it. And his favorite study was World War II. And once when he was little, he ran up to me and said, those Nazis were just terrible people, weren't they? Just awful. But they did have some kind of snappy uniforms. Well, so he then returned to watch the Nazis in their snappy uniforms. But he always said that our country should never, ever be attacked again by terrible people who want to kill us and take over our country. The years passed happily, and then came 9-11. <sighs> we were attacked on our own soil again. As was everyone, we were consumed by disbelief and despair at the devastation to our country, but Matthew was way more than that. He went silent 
and then he transformed in the following days from devastation to questioning, then questioning to anger, and then commitment. He set us down and said he was joining the Army, and we said, no, 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 no. You, you finish college, and then you can join the Army. But his commitment continued. And one day, he told us his destiny. He was joining the Army. His destiny was to be part of others who felt like he did, which there was nothing like this would ever happen to our country again. Never, ever again. Thus, Iraq became his future. And immediately following his homecoming from his first tour, he asked if we could go to New York. Of course we knew why, and we did. The first stop we made was Ground Zero. Once there, he just looked at the devastation for so long. I was so worried about his reaction to that terrible sight. And then I saw a single tear roll down his face. And he gathered me in his arms, and he looked at me with such love and concern that I burst into tears. And then he said, don't cry, Mom. It's OK. It really is, Mom. There are some things worth dying for, and that's my family and my country. And then came a call we never expected. He said he was going to go back early to Iraq. We were shocked and so unhappy and asked him, why would he do that? And then he replied that if he did, those soldiers who had families would be able to spend more time with those families. He said it was the right thing for him to do and that someday somebody would do the same for him. Before he left, we flew to be with him for a few days. It was pretty unbearable seeing him walk to that plane. But he turned around and saw me sobbing, and he blew me a kiss. And later, he told his army bodies to never let their parents see them off. It was just too painful for them, and that was the last time I saw him alive. But I will never, ever forget the love he sent to me as he left. He wanted to be the best soldier ever. He called once and was so happy that he had been asked to go for drinks with some couple of officers. Apparently, they had more than just a few because when I asked if it went well, he said that when he could remember, he'd be sure and let me know. But after his death, we received a letter from his unit telling us what a superior soldier he was, and we certainly treasure that letter. And then came May the 3rd. 2007, the day we became part of a club that no parent wants to belong to. I was in bed reading, and my husband came in and said three words I will never forget. He cried, we've lost Matthew. And then when I saw the emotions on the sergeant and the chaplain's faces, it hit me that it was actually true. Pain such as I have never experienced before shot through me. It was the greatest agony I had ever felt. It was in every part of my mind, my body, my soul. My head was screaming, no, 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 no. And then my body and mind in self-defense shut down. I went numb. This went on for two months, and then God helped me, I thawed. And every day was a nightmare. How was I supposed to live without him? I'll be honest with you, I thought so many times about killing myself, but I couldn't do that to my daughter and husband as, such much, as much as I desired to end the pain. But I was not alone in my pain. Emma was totally lost in her own grief, and unbeknownst to us, she began taking pre prescription drugs to help her deal with it. And the drugs got stronger and stronger and stronger, ending up with her a heroin addict. The most frightening thought I think I've ever had is losing both children. But then reality rose. She needed help, and we got it for her. 
and she has now finally accepted that while Matthew is physically gone, he remains deeply and strongly within her. She's now been clean for four years and is now committed to helping others with their pain and addiction. But now, it's today. It's today. Do you remember what I read to you about the love I felt when I looked at my baby Matthew for the first time? Love like I've never felt filled my mind, my heart, my soul. And you know what? My beautiful memories of him continue. And tears of joy also continue to fill my eyes when I think how blessed I was to have had him for 24 years. And my mind, my heart, and my soul today, tomorrow, and every day is consumed with my love for him. Consumed today, tomorrow, and forever. And you know what? Therefore, he continues to live forever. This time I'd like to introduce you to one of the brothers from Brothers and Sisters that's dedicated his life to serving veterans. He, he just retired as a physician's assistant here at the Charles George. And we're so proud that he joined our group, and that is Dean Little. what I carried. Each morning after, I tossed into a pile, blood stiff fatigue pants, clayed it like armor, fatigue jacket with red splotches, echoing screams and silence in memory. I would not carry them starting this day. In the morning, thumping like war drums, artillery fire continues from the night. War knows no sleep nor rest. Each day I scrub clean, shed the red dust, bits of flesh, drag a razor over boyish man whiskers, grab clean or near clean fatigues, skivvies, socks, brush red stuff or just stuff from my boots. Maybe make a smile in the mirror to see if that part still works. First, the team hurts itself together. Reports given on our charges, new, recovering, the dead. I walk to start my assignments, strap on stainless steel scissors and hemostats, carry trays of needles and slides for malaria sticks and blood draws, IV starts, tubes for front, back, and sides, sometimes carry restraints for the delirious or mad, carrying to the sadness or lost hope in their eyes. Radio man's bad news box shouts casualties a lot. Some are women, some are children. We treat civilians too to win hearts and minds. All wards cut loose responders to receiving. We grab our steel, large bores, and tourniquets. We are ready to strip with sheer edges, but first we assemble on the helipad, carrying litters and gurneys to unload choppers and ferry wounded inside. We sort by triage at the door, first come first on stretchers, held up by sawhorses like a construction site or a site of destruction or sanity's deconstruction. Not enough room, use the floor. 
the hallway. Avoid the morgue. Avoid the morgue. Clamp the pumpers. Sew the parts into opposition. Prep for surgery. Hold parts on during x-rays. Stick them, tube them, bandages, press and hold, tape well. Carry the expectant to a second place, quieter and less busy. Lights are softer. We carry painkillers for comfort. We carry blankets for the shock shivering ones. We take turns rotating to the goodbye place. Our hands drift out to wipe blood from eyes and faces. I see the nine-year-old's angelic face in repose. He could be sleeping. I wish it were quieter. Tasked to take his vitals every 15 minutes until he lets go, until he meets his eternity. I move around to grab a pulse from his neck, and then, and then I see that punched out hole, rectangular, seared by a metal fragment deep. His wound is not prepped. His little boy black hair tries to cover the bad thing. A place is found for all. Some helicoptered out, surgery list created, a stretcher cue to the OR. The air is redolent with the smell of copper, sweat, urine, excrement, unspeakable things. Receiving is decorated with IV bottles, tubing, bandages draped across bodies. Battle dressings overflow waste cans, red and green fatigue rags wrapped like bunting around sawhorses, sawhorse legs. As if we feverishly prepared receiving for a macabre festival of death. Every couple, every several days, they're in the raining sideways, monsoons or the hot dry, my turn for perimeter defense force. My turn to draw and carry my M16 flak jacket, steel pot, a drooping 14 magazine bandolier, canteen and three flares for use as needed. Climb a tower on the line as nighttime falls. Spend 12 hours watching, scanning in 50 yard arcs, waiting. Carrying fatigue was a constant burden, a state of being. By the end of that longest year, I had closed the eyes of my brothers, closed the eyes of women and children, I had seen so much valor and sacrifice by those who bore the brunt of battle. I saw it so many times the efforts of many get the job done right. I carried home the guilt of surviving when others had not. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. This time I'd like to introduce you to a medevac nurse that served in the United States Air Force in Vietnam and Desert Storm. I was in a class a couple of weeks ago and I heard this lady read this story. I hope it affects you the way it affected me. This time I'll introduce you to Monica Blankenship. Mission, August 2021, Kabul has fallen. Chaos, desperation, terror, death, frantic evacuations, the attempts to get out. The graphic picture of a baby being handed over barbed wire to a Marine by a begging mother. Like a gut punch to memory, the babies. April, 1975, 
It's finally going to be over. Saigon has fallen. Again, frantic, desperate attempts to get out. I'm less than a year in the Air Force, a second lieutenant nurse coming off of night shift, sort of the bottom of the food chain, right? Women's surgery at David Grant Medical Center, Travis Air Force Base. As I prepare to head home, my friend Connie, coming on today's, and I were notified that we were being reassigned temporarily to AES, Aravac Staging Facility. Report there the next morning. Made sense, a whole lot of troops coming through Travis in those days. The next morning, there they were, the babies. The littlest from the experience of Saigon in their cardboard box beds, needing everything. Operation Baby Lift. It began April 4th, 1975. The humanitarian U.S. attempt ordered by President Ford to evacuate as many as possible from the emptying, frightened orphanages of Saigon. C-141s and C-5s already hauling troops began bringing the children over the Pacific. These troops held those babies for takeoff and landings and for many of the long flight hours, caring for them along with the flight medical staff. In AES, we worked long, long hours, bathing, feeding, treating the myriad of what needed to be treated, holding and comforting as we could. And then the guys, these troops, coming into the unit as they were leaving Travis, they came to hold and say goodbye to their babies, the ones they had held and helped with for those long hours. Little Mai Tai, as she was called by her soldier, smiling in his arms, crying again as he left, and the tears he tried to hide, and my tears watching. <laughs> Those were the pictures never taken, but logged in my mind. No, it wasn't the work that drained, but the emotion. The in-your-face impact of the war's reality in our safe corner of the world. We saw it, of course, in the faces and manner of the troops coming back. And we dealt with that on one level. But this, this was really different for me. These children, not AP pictures, but in my arms. Some truly war orphans, yes. Some Amerasian, fathered by an American and given up by a young Vietnamese girl. Some thrust at American personnel by parents begging to get their child to safety and to a better life. There were many flights in those crazy days of Operation Baby Lift, civilian and military, each with their own story. Over 2,000 children were rescued and eventually found new homes. But there is at least one story that needs telling here. The first flight on April 4th, the C-5 that didn't make it to Travis or even to the Philippines. With over 300 on board, it crashed shortly after takeoff, when a cargo door burst open at 23,000 feet. 128 died, 78 of them children. A nurse I later met very briefly was the medical crew director for that flight and only survived because she had just left the cargo area to retrieve some medication upstairs. Though significantly injured herself, she, among others, reportedly crawled back, repeatedly crawled back into a burning plane in a rice paddy to pull as many out as they could. I was so in awe of her. I later became a flight nurse myself, flew many of those long Pacific theater hours as crew director, and realized in a very small way a portion of the magnitude of what she and those people were dealing with at that time. So where do I go with this story now? Maybe it's titled wrong. 
maybe the babies, maybe the innocent victims, I don't know. But in remembering these victims, I see again other victims I encountered during that time as a nurse. The young troops we had as patients with their debilitating injuries, emotional and psychological trauma that led to enormous substance abuse, loneliness, and isolation in their communities those that could never find normal again, those that died in our care, the medical staff that tried, fought it with them, that burned out. So this is what Kabul brought back to me, overwhelming remembering, tears, and questioning a world where it continues to happen. I now have children of my own who have been in Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Ukraine. An old friend, a Jesuit priest that I spent, that spent over 50 years in Indian Nepal, said to me once, mothers should run countries. I believe him. Thank you, Monica. Before I introduce our next reader, I would like to thank the Charles George VA Hospital and the staff here for taking care of our brother, our friend. The care that he was given here in his last days was second to none, the best I've ever seen. These people here work with pride and they show how they really appreciate the veteran. And I attribute that a lot to Stephanie Young and her leadership. So at this time I would like to ask that Ron Toller come up and read this fitting piece for this day about our friend that was born in 1946 and passed away in the last few days in 2022. Ron Toller. Today I'm going to read you a piece from David Rozell. David was a medic in Vietnam and he was affected his entire life by what he saw. The title of the piece is What Healing Looks Like. To drop the rusty eight foot length steel chain which holds the key the ring of idle keys just out of reach of my tired left hand. To know I am no longer responsible for remembering which triple-plated copper padlock keeps the anger trigger within from escaping and which bone tooth key keeps that lock fast and the beast behind its flimsy door at bay. To know which key tightens the screen door and works so pitifully, yet is responsible for slowing the night horrors, ghosts, and goals. To release my death grip from the key that controls the lock, which keeps the higher windows closed. To slow the cold fears, which scream by the loose-fitting frame of those windows and my being tested and prepped for fight, to push with confidence the stubble, stubborn turnstile that bars me from any seat except the absolute back row nearest the aisle, to gently turn and release and relax my grip on the icy doorknob behind which potential friends await, to walk airily, quietly, peacefully hearing the clang of the chain and keys, knowing they are real, 
but do not control my soul. This time, I would like to uh, ask my friend and a great employee of the VA, Chaplain Jeremiah Richards, to come up and give our closing benediction. Will you please pray with me? God of compassion, God of peace, we thank you for this opportunity to gather, honor, and remember all who have served in the United States military. We pray for those who have served our nation and have laid down their lives to protect and defend our freedom. We pray for those who have fought, whose spirits and bodies are scarred by war, whose nights are haunted by memories too painful for the light of day. Heal their wounds, comfort their hearts, grant them peace. We pray for those who serve us now, especially for those in harm's way. Shield them from danger and bring them home soon. May the peace you left us, the peace you gave us, be the peace that sustains the peace that saves us. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain Richards. As this weekend goes, I hope you will go out and find a friend or a family member that has served this nation and give them a good hug and just listen to what they have to say. This concludes today's ceremony. I would like to thank all the presenters and all those of you that listened to this on YouTube today and in the days following. A pleasant and safe day. We hope to see everyone Veterans Day 2023. Thank you.